Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Today we are speaking with Serena Cotton. Serena is a wife to Rodney, a mother of Mace, Robert, Darius, and Christopher, godmother to Jamar, and grandmother of 11. After her youngest son Christopher was murdered in 2007, Serena started an anti-violence not-for-profit organization called Rock the Peace. Her organization has organized free community events that focuses on victims who have been impacted by the senseless violence that has plagued her community of Rochester, New York. 2021 will be the 11th annual Rock the Peace Festival. Serena and members of her family are in the first of three documentaries called Voices of Violence. Serena partners with several organizations in which she goes into both elementary and junior high schools speaking to children about living a nonviolent culture. In 2017, Serena initiated a meeting with Mayor Lovely Warren, which led to honoring Miss Audrey Smith with a tree being planted at the Victims' Rights Memorial in Highland Park. She's involved with the Safe Summer Initiative, among a host of numerous community-based projects. She and her Rock the Peace team have also joined the Rock Against Gun Violence Coalition. Recently, Serena has started a Rock the Peace in Our Community ministry within First Genesis Baptist Church. The focus of this program is for children who have lost their parent or siblings to violence either by death or prison. On September 25, 2018, Serena and her Rock the Peace team organized the National Day of Remembrance of Murder Victims. This was held at the First Genesis Baptist Church and will now be an annual event hosted by Rock the Peace. A certificate of special mayoral designation was given to Serena in recognition of this day. Welcome, Serena. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. We really appreciate you joining us today for this topic. It's one that we wanted to talk about for a long time. When we talk about grief, our first thoughts are often that of an elderly person at the end of their life and the accompanying funeral memories and gatherings. You, however, experienced what to me is the cruelest experience a mother could possibly endure, the loss of your child. This was even more to the extreme as you lost your son to violence. So could you help us understand what happened? My son, Christopher Jones, he was 16 years old. There was a fight where a young girl cousin assumed, well, we found out later on what the fight was about. Um, A young girl lied about her age and her cousin assumed my son, Christopher, knew the girl's real age, told Christopher she was 16 when in fact she was 12. So her cousin came to fight Chris. And in the midst of the fight, it was told that Chris got the better of the, you know, the best of the fight and gave the cousin two black eyes. And his friend, uh, which was also a friend of my other boys and Chris, took a gun and shot Chris when he seen his friend's eyes. That's, I can't even begin to imagine. And as I understand it, you were with him when this happened as well. Yes, um, it, it happened across the street from home because Christopher was 16. But for my home, he had a nine o'clock curfew. And this was a, you know, a little at the eight. So he decided, you know, I'm just going to stay around the house. It's almost curfew time or whatever. And um, I knew he was out and I heard the commotion. So it made me run out there to see, you know, what was all this noise. And as I was running from one side of the street to the other is when uh, Chris was standing there and all of a sudden he turned to run. And the reason he turned to run is because that's when the friend got out the vehicle with the gun. So Chris ran, but ran in the opposite direction of me. So as I'm running toward them screaming his name, um, he ran the opposite way. And um, I saw his face the moment he was shot and um, I was still running to get to him. 
and uh, the friend and the cousin uh, were also behind Chris. And I just, you know, grabbed the two of them and, and to get them away from Chris, you know, right. and chase them back to their vehicle and got the license plate. So they were caught within an hour because they got on the throughway and went straight to Lockport. And by right. the time they pulled up in the driveway at Lockport, the police were sitting there waiting on them. Right. And so literally in, in the blink of an eye, your your world shattered. I'm sure after any death, there's always that those moments where you feel all kinds of emotions. But when the death is related to trauma and especially to violence, it seems so senseless. Can you remember any or describe any of the emotions that were just kind of flooding your your life at that point or even over the next day or so? Well, he didn't die right then. So we were still talking to him. He told me he loved me. Uh, they took him to Strong and someone, police or whoever it was, can't remember, uh, drove behind the ambulance. And uh, once we got there, I had a moment to, uh, you know, we told each other we love each other. He was still talking and everything. And he went in and to me, it was, I didn't think he was about to die mm -hmm. uh, because he was still talking to me. Right. He So in my mind, Christopher, first of all, Christopher, two days before that, Christopher found out his eyes had got bad, worse. And um, he had eyes of an 82-year-old man. He oh. had severe glaucoma. Okay. So in my mind, I'm saying, okay, he's going blind. Right. And he's going to be paralyzed. So right. I just have to take care of my baby. So that that was my main emotion at the hospital until until the fateful moment when they come and tell you the bad news or whatever. Right. But I was so, I, I don't even know what I was feeling. You know, I just screamed and screamed and screamed till I was, I was hoarse for a whole week because that's how much I was screaming after they told me. Yeah. And it was just, now I got to keep get my family you know, be strong for my family. And that's right. how I've been ever since. But right. it really didn't hit me until a year and a day oh. after Wow, is when it hit me because of Christopher eyes. When he come in nine o'clock curfew, he comes straight to my room and he just keep knocking, knock, 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 knock on my door playing, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll be like, come in and he'll just keep knocking. <laughs> and, uh, so a year and a day, I'm sitting in my room waiting on the knock. Oh. It's 8.55. It's 9 o'clock. It's 9.05. I'm looking out the window, and I'm like, and that's when it hit me. Wait, he's really gone. Oh my he's not knocking on my door yeah. for me to put the eye drops in his eyes. He's really gone. And that was the worst cry. Oh, and I, I, I and, and I was in my room by myself, and I just cried and cried yeah. till I just couldn't cry anymore. Because, yeah. and, and 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 I was uh, dealing with the fact that my mom was dying of cancer. Oh my so, goodness! So yeah, so she died a few weeks later. Do you think that you just felt like numb for that whole first year? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because everything happened so fast, okay? Yeah. Christopher uh, was murdered November 17th, and then uh, his trial was July. Right before the trial, my oldest son was shot uh, because he was with one of the witnesses in Christopher's case, and they were trying to shoot at him, at the witness, and my son was ha happened to be with him uh, right across the street from my home. Of, oh, yeah. And um, in the same location, and um, he was sitting in his car, and someone came up and shot at the witness, missed the witness, and shot my oldest son. And then a few days later, it was the trial. And um, during the trial, we had our first, you know, it's Christopher's birthday in July. So that was the first peace fest in, right after the trial. Mm -hmm. And then uh, September. Uh, was the sentencing 
And then November, here we go again, is the one year anniversary. So it was so much going on during that time. And in the midst of that, in September, they gave my mom three months to live. So I was going through my mom fighting cancer that year to my oldest son getting shot and the trial and just everything. Right, right. So you did what a lot of people do. You just stuff your emotions away Mm -hmm. because you need to keep functioning Mm -hmm. for other people, for your Mm -hmm. other son, for your mom and everything. You need to keep functioning. So you stuffed everything. And it wasn't until you were sitting quietly in your room that you unstuffed. So exactly. Oh, my goodness. You know, these are things that we see on TV. And if you haven't experienced it, if you haven't lived it or know someone that has, it's almost surreal to you. And I know mm-hmm. it's difficult to still talk about it. And again, I think this was back in 2007. So Correct. this was 14 years ago, um, approximately. Yeah. 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 We accept, Stephanie and I and a lot of our listeners, that grief sometimes, you're going to grieve for the rest of your lives. In some instances, you never really get past a certain point. You may Mm -hmm. continue to function. You may continue to move on. You may reach a point that you accept the fact that it happened, but you still grieve. You still have them in your memories and you still think of things that they are missing out and that you are missing out with them. Exactly. Right. So I don't know exactly, Serena, how you and I connected in our networks I don't know exactly how it happened, but I know that shortly after we ke- we became connected on Facebook, I started to see everything that you were involved in. And I, I have to admit, I became somewhat fascinated, if you will, <laughs> by the fact that for everything you experienced, you have been able to move on to the level where you are now known as a community activist. <laughs> and I think the first organization I saw you connected with was Rock the Peace. That is my organization. Did this happen kind of as a result of what you experienced? Yes. It, it started as the very first Peace Festival. And mm-hmm. this year is the 11th annual. It would have been a 12th, but because of the pandemic. It's right. Still the 11th from last year. Um, but Chris' birthday is in July, July 23rd. Okay. He'll actually be 30 this year. And uh, for his birthday, he always made a big deal about his birthday. So that's why we had the very first Peace Fest following his death that July. Senator Joe Robach was the keynote speaker. And we it it, it was a lot. You know, we did a lot. And um, after that, um, I connected with someone and they said, you should do this. You should continue to do this. Mm-hmm. So we we have been doing the Peace Fest. But in the midst of this, you don't notice things until it happened to you. So Christopher was one of three people killed within 24 hours and the youngest. And he was the 52nd homicide of 2007. So that's when I started noticing homicide. So the first Peace Fest was called Peace for Chris and Other Victims of Violence, which we later changed the name to Rock the Peace to acknowledge everyone in Rochester. And we want peace in Rochester. Right. So through the years, uh, we've done, we partner with Rise Up Rochester. That's our main partner that we partner with. And we've done a lot together. Uh, myself and Wanda Ridgeway, um, she's running for County legislator in the 21st district. I'm gonna shout her out. That's, That's okay. bestie. That's, okay. <laughs> That's my best. And I recognize her name. So you're all yes. doing a good job. <laughs> yes, yes. And she is out here. Okay. It was a time when it was just her and I walking these streets and knocking on doors and trying to find answers to the violence and, and, uh, passing out resources and, you know, things of that nature, having uh, peace circles, we call it. We call it, Now we call it walk, talk, and pray. Mm-hmm. And we go in, you know, I go into the small Rock the Peace team. We go into the schools and talk to the children. We do speaking engagements um, within Rock the Peace. 
we started two groups. Uh, one is Why My Baby, which is a group for parents who lost uh, children to violence, either by death or prison. Mm-hmm. Because some some have a child that's that was murdered, some have a child that's in prison, right. and um, and then we started the group Youth for Peace, which is a youth group for uh, those five and up who lost parents or siblings to violence by death or prison, suicide, things of that nature. So uh, we we try and we try to you know do what we can in the community. Mm-hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. Serena, are you also advocating? My little birdie told me that you're also advocating for some cold case resolution also. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Pastor Sharita Trawick, she's also running for county lady in Greece. Um, shout her out. <laughs> um, she has, She's a pastor in her uh, Young and Gifted Global Ministries. Uh, we're partnering, and we call it hashtag cold case files. Um, so we sat down with, uh, the police investigators and, um, others. And, um, there's over 600 cold cases dating back from 1968. Mm-hmm. And, um, so we're, uh, working on the cold cases where we're getting folks who case has not been solved, even if it happened last week. You know, if the case hasn't been solved, it's a cold case. Uh, where we're going out to wherever the location where the person was murdered. And we, we make a flyer specifically for that person with their picture and information and everything and, uh, Crime Stoppers phone number and our phone number to contact us. If you know something, see something, just say something is our, um, slogan. So we're working on that and, and, and Jer- Senator Cooney uh, reached out and he want to help. He want to send us a donation to help with that. So we're mm-hmm. waiting on that. But yeah. Oh. <laughs> so as busy as you are, Serena, how often do you think of your son? All day, every day. Yep. Every day. Um, Especially, and, and this is not for me. This is for moms, dads too, grandparents uh, that lost children. It's hard to not think about them. Yeah. Everyone is different. Everyone mourn different. Right. Me, I take my, you know, instead of going to a therapist, rack a piece is my therapy. If I can help one mom, one child, one sibling, mm-hmm. um, seeing how my boy I have three other sons. Christopher was the youngest of four. And I'm raising another kid, nine years old. So I see how it affected them. So if I can help one person, Mm -hmm. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And that helps me. That helps me move along because of the person my son was. Right. You know, Christopher was that person that held everyone together. He was the youngest, but he was the oldest, you know, Mm -hmm. and and, uh, just, you know, just just doing what I can in the community. And and just, you know, and I have a wonderful team, a wonderful Mm -hmm. team. Uh, We pray together. We laugh and we cry together. Mm -hmm. They they're wonderful. They hold me together. We hold each other together. I was going through something this past week. My father had to have heart surgery yesterday. So one of my team members stopped by and he just started praying for me. And that's the type of team I have, you know. Uh, we say good morning every morning and good night every night to one another. So I, I have to shout them out. I appreciate them. It's so an extended much. family. It is. They said they said we're not a team. We're a family. Right. And I, you know, I got to remember right. that. Right. Is your son on your mind as you organize and participate in all of these initiatives that you're part of? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. Because oh, this is what I was getting at. It, it's around anniversaries or holidays. Um, so his birthday is coming up. So no matter how much I don't want to think about it, so it won't, you know, I can't help it. Yeah. Like you think about, okay, he was 16 at the time, but this year he would have been turning 30. What would he be doing? Well, he had the surgery to correct his, his vision. Uh-huh. Would he be driving? Would he went to college? Would he have children? Would he have? Right. Then Mary, you know, you think about all of these things. He was tall. He was almost six feet tall and just beautiful. He was so handsome. Like, um, 
you know, how much taller would he have been? <laughs> you know, just yeah. you think about any and everything. Right. You know, would he have facial hair? He had a whole lot of hair, a head full of hair. <laughs> so would he have cut his hair? Or, you know, you think about so yeah. much. Yeah. But yeah. You, my worst thought is, uh, sometimes it pops up in my head without me wanting to think about it is the the look on his face the moment he was shot. Yeah, I yeah. I'm I'm lost for words just yeah. Imagining that. Serena, I know Christopher would be so very proud of you. And you speak of anniversaries and birthdays and special moments like that. So many people that have suffered a loss might pick those opportunities to hide, to isolate, to stay at home, to stay away and avoid everybody, friends and family, you instead have turned it into a lifelong endeavor, a legacy for Christopher, that you're going to go out and support people that you know need help because you have experienced needing that help and support. And I can't tell you how much I admire you for doing that and for having the strength Mm -hmm. to create the the initiatives you have and to keep them going and to just put it out there and put yourself out there. So we want to offer you just a few moments. We're kind of running out of time here, but we want to give you a chance to speak to anyone out there who might either have lost a loved one to trauma or violence, or maybe they're supporting someone who has lost someone to trauma or violence. Just talk to them. Just let them know what's in your heart. It's hard. You know, it's hard. It's hard to tell someone how to mourn. That's the thing. But what's even harder is when someone who have not faced this pain try to tell someone, say like me or another mom, how they should be mourning. That is the worst thing to do, to say, I'm so sorry. You know, that's not good to say to us because you didn't, You because in our mind, you wasn't the one that took my child's life. Mm -hmm. To tell someone you should be over it by now, or you shouldn't be thinking about it, or just get over it, or things of that nature. That's something never tell someone. And that's something that if you are going through this, don't allow someone to tell you how to feel or how you should be feeling. And and what I find and what I tell mom is find your place of peace. Whatever your place, it could be a picture, it could be a flower, it could be a color, it could be a smell, it could be a place. Whatever your place of peace, when you're in that moment, Go to your place of peace, even if it's in your mind, and it'll, it'll help. It'll help. Thank you. We often ask our guests, what can you say or what should you not say to someone who is suffering? Because that's, it's a very difficult and awkward moment for everybody. Mm-hmm. And we're, we've almost come to the conclusion that the best thing to say is absolutely nothing. Nothing. Just let them know <laughs> that you're there. You're thinking of them. Hugs are great. And maybe now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we can get back to that good old fashioned hugging again. I never stop hugging. (laughs) Well, good. (laughs) Good. Good. Yes. Yeah. We appreciate so much, Serena. I can't tell you enough. Mm -hmm. And I could just, I could speak about you forever. I tell my friends constantly that I am connected through my network with this lady who, and I, I talk about you a lot. So if your ears are ever ringing, it's <laughs> That's because... what is going on. My ears be ringing all the time. <laughs> that is, it's, it's because I am in, because Kathy. again, I am just so impressed with how you have taken this horrible, horrible thing that never should happen to exactly. anyone ever. Mm-hmm. And you have turned it around into a legacy that is helping so, so many people. Mm-hmm. And you are an inspiration to so many and it, it's a big job what you've taken on. It is. It is. But it is. With baby steps, hopefully it mm-hmm. you know, it their change can be made. Yeah. I um called together a community meeting for tomorrow at uh 
the Maplewood Rose Garden at 6 right. p.m. Uh-huh. Um, because there's so many organizations going in different directions, but we all right. want the same thing. Yeah, so let's exactly. come together. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's no. great. And, you know, if anybody can pull it all together, Serena, my money's on you. <laughs> Let me tell you that. So we'll wrap it up for now. For our audience, we are going to have the the links to Rock the Peace and all the initiatives that Serena's involved in. We're going to have that in the episode notes for the podcast as well as on our website. And we, again, say thank you so much and hope that everyone listens again next week. Thanks, Serena. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at as I live and grieve dot com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.